Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Big Idea. The U.S. mission to ASEAN started this show because we know that there are many, many Southeast Asian leaders who have taken big ideas and turned them into a reality, and they can inspire us all. I'm your host, Jason Seymour, and I have a special guest today. His name is Elroy Ramantan, and he is from Brunei. Let's bring him in now. Welcome, Elroy. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me here. It was a, it's a great afternoon at the moment. I hope you're having a great day as well. Oh, thank you so much, Elroy. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. So you have done all kinds of amazing things in your community, and we're going to get to some of the specifics. But just to tell our audience, one of the causes that is so passionate or so important to you that you are so passionate about is inclusion of indigenous communities and focusing on the needs of indigenous communities in Brunei. So my first question is, before we get to the specifics, from where does this passion come? Why is this an important cause for you? So how did this passion came about is when throughout my whole life in Brunei, I knew that my identity, my indigenous identity is not recognized in Brunei. As much as I just put it to the side, I realized that when, as the older I get, the more that, and my identity was a huge part of me, and it was one of the obstacles that was not allowing me to, to excel in what I wanted to do. One of the reasons why is that there's some sort of identity repression if that's not of a majority identity in Brunei. So I realized that there are more minority and indigenous people in Brunei. So it came to the about that as much as there are, there's other indigenous people in Brunei, but if we were to be, if we were to group all of us together, that's quite a huge population. Then with a with this much number, there is a voice, which there's a voice of number, that's a huge voice they're able to make a change with. So that's when I said, hey, that's my idea. I want to include all the indigenous people, all the minority and marginalized people to come together and then to realize that we actually do can make a change uh, as a community. So that's one of the things that made me realize that, hey, I do have an idea that can make a change. One of the reasons I really wanted you to be on this show is because people of every country can relate to what you're talking about. Besides the fact that we all have an identity, every country struggles with what does it mean to be a citizen of that country? What does it mean to have an identity that doesn't match with other people from the country? In the United States, we're a multicultural society. We have people, we have immigrants, we have indigenous populations, we have such variety, but it's not just America. Every Southeast Asian country uh, focuses on this reality and tries to make it work to create a cohesive society. So there's a lot for us to talk about today. So I'd love just for our audience for you to identify your indigenous community and just tell us a little bit more about your culture and your community. All right, so I'm I'm in Brunei and that's in the that's one of the few countries in Borneo that is Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia. But as much as that is my my national identity, I also am an indigenous identity of Borneo that is the Iban tribe of Borneo. The the Iban tribe does not only does not only belongs in Brunei, but the whole Borneo, there is also parts in Malaysia, in Sabah and Sarawak, and also parts in Kalimantan, Indonesia. So as much that we do, there are other events people in the whole Borneo, but national borders do not separate us. We do have a history, we do have a culture, a language that we're able to connect with. As much as we are different by nationality, we can have a commonality in our indigenous identity. One of the things that we're actually quite known for is that the Iban people are historically known as the headhunters of Borneo, where they're, they're able to conquer lands and places because they're quite notorious for become notorious warriors. That's that is in history. Where one of the things that we're also known for is that we are known for our long houses, where we live in long, uh, the houses are literally in longitudinal, where we live in a huge community and family. That's one of the interesting things that the Iban tribes are known for. Another thing is that we're known for our dances, and most of the population is mostly on Sarawak, Malaysia. Just that, coincidentally, 
I am residing in, Bru uh, in Brunei. Sadly, Brunei does not recognize my indigenous identity as a Bruneian identity. But that's, a, that's one of the reasons why that's another idea, that as much that I am indigenous, I am also a minority in the Bruneian sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't ask you to do a demonstration of one of those dances, but I do hope when I visit Brunei, you'll, you'll give me a lesson. But let's, let's talk about how many indigenous communities are uh, officially recognized by the country of Brunei? Well, Brunei has seven indigenous communities, uh, but sadly, Iban and also one other, one other smaller tribes in Brunei are not recognized. But officially, there are seven, so, uh, mm -hmm. just that I am not part of the seven. As much that it's not a, such a huge deal, but when it comes to policies and lawmaking, these seven tribes are also included in these policies. But as comes to show, when things are rolled out, we're, we are not included, we are not accommodated because, and we do not have the privileges as much as the other indigenous tribes because we're not part of that policy. So that's one of the ways that it's not a huge deal, but because it's part of the, because it adds on to the law and policies, it makes a huge gap there that we need to realize as well. Well, this is something that's important to your community and other indigenous communities that are not recognized. So what are some of the programs or initiatives that you're doing to develop the appreciation for this tribe and, and other indigenous tribes? So my project actually started in November of last year during 2020 when I debuted it. So one of the first thing that we, when I, when we did our program was to actually talk about the solidarity of the Bornean identity in Brunei. That is, I gather all the indigenous people of uh, all the indigenous people that is found in Brunei, and we talk about how does it feel to be indigenous and Bruneian at the same time. And it, most in Bruneian context, we are quite known for our philosophy of pro Malay race, Islamic, and also for the royals. But if you're not part of these three concepts of, of Brunei, you're kind of seen as lesser than or not much, not Bruneian enough. But when it comes, what happens if your identity is you're Bruneian and also your indigenous, which is one identity where it's not Bruneian and Bruneian. So how can we find a common ground in such identity? So we did talk about privilege. We talked about if there's any racism or any experience that we have when we show our identity or are we indigenous enough if we do not speak our mother tongue or are we Bruneian enough if we are not belonging to a typical identity of their race. So that's one of the things that we talk about. And as much as the identity is a diaspora in Borneo or in parts of Southeast Asia, how are we still continuing our culture and identity in this today's modern time? So those are the first thing that I had in my first program. And then as the time continues on, I did have a program where it teaches on dancing, traditional dances, on introducing on... Uh, the identity Borneo is, if we were to think on an indigenous identity, people always think that we have feathers on our heads and traditional clothes, or we actually half naked. But as much as some point of it's true, but there are some points that we're more than just a traditional or stereotypical identity, that we are also living in a house with Wi-Fi, wearing clothes. So I do want to challenge on, there's more than just a stereotypical indigenous native identity that we always assume. So that's one of the things that I actually currently am doing with my cultural project. It's excellent. And I'm happy to say that the US government has supported you on some of your initiatives. And, and you're absolutely right when you talked about stereotypes. There are stereotypes of every culture. I'm sure you have some stereotypes of the United States. It's common. And then you start getting to know these communities and you realize that there's a lot more to learn about these either indigenous communities or any community. So what are some of the challenges faced by members of your community? You mentioned that sometimes there's, there are issues of privilege, there are issues of discrimination, sometimes racism at the extreme. What are some of the challenges that you and other indigenous communities face in Brunei and Southeast Asia? I think one of the challenges that I experienced personally is that when I do say that I am Iban and Bruneian, people do not believe me that I am Bruneian. 
they always think that oh I believe you're not Bruneian you must be from Malaysia but no mm. I was I am a fourth generation Iban in Brunei how many generations do I have to prove myself that I am Bruneian and I am also Iban at the same time second is that when 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 I do mention about my cultural and indigenous identity people only blanket term me as that identity only so people assume that oh I am native so I must be in the rainforest oh i am i must be always half naked all the time or i have feathers on my head so there's always this stereotypes connotation and up uh behavior when people talk to me but i do believe that it came from a very stereotypical stereotypical assumptions which is quite very outdated it could be very the mis- uh, discriminatory at times another thing is that one of the challenges we we are always seen as a tourist tourist catch as much as culture our culture is very rich we are quite known in our in terms of the uh, tourism industry but we're more than just a cultural cultural grab in the tourist industry we can also be talking about social issues like how i'm talking right now or in terms of environmental environmental issues uh what i learned is that 80% of the environment or our rainforest is actually protected by 20% the indigenous people are occupying the land if that is much of how 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 integrated that we are with the environment it comes to show that we too must be agents of protecting our environment but yet brunei does not see us as part of the agents of protecting the environment but only see us in terms of just a tourism as a tourism cultural novel, novelty so that's one of the challenges that i experience here in brunei and is there tension between the different indigenous communities within Brunei or are you able to work together to raise awareness cuz perhaps you have similar issues uh in, in term of Brunei context we don't have any issues with other indigenous tribes the recognized or unrecognized but one of the problems one of the issues that we have in Brunei is that we do not actually live out our cultural roots So as much as there are seven groups in uh, official groups that are recognized by Brunei, but Brunei don't quite actually want to take care of its own culture. But if Brunei does not take care of its own seven culture, what more the culture that is not of Brunei in per se, that is my culture. So that's why I want to take, hey, I want to take my own reign of my culture. I do not have to wait for the government or the, the country to take care of me, but it is my responsibility. So I'll take it to myself. it depends on whether if the country were to recognize me that i'm taking care of my own but i want to take care of my own culture but do we have an issue no but we do have an issue of preserving culture because brunei really has this obsession of going to be globalized or international but that problem comes arise that brunei tends to lose its cultural roots mm-hmm. so we have a comment you have a friend iman jasmina from malaysia Wow. And, and uh you were mentioning that uh your indigenous community has roots in multiple Southeast Asian countries not just Brunei. Are the, do conversations occur between people of a uh, Bornean descent w- within Southeast Asia because uh you probably have brothers and sisters throughout the region. Yeah, we do have, but mostly the Iban tribes or the Dis tribes of Borneo are mostly populated in born in the Bornean island that is in Malaysia, uh in East Asia and also in parts of Kalimantan. So when I do went to other parts in Malaysia or Kalimantan, it's interesting that although we're unable to we we can talk in our language in our national language but when it comes to our cultural language we're able to click immediately like hey as much that you have different kinds of accents because of your country but yet i still understand you because this is the same language we have so it's quite am- amazing that in our culture language is one of the few, one of the many bridges that we're able to connect as much as i do not know you i do not know your background or your history but yet language is the first thing that we connect the next one is food the food that i eat historically is also connected to you and the best thing about iban is that in our culture we do believe in heritage and lineage where we can able to trace back our bloodline with our family from in history and our, our family tree so one way or another if i were to trace back my roots 
I can also find my roots back in parts of Malaysia, in Sarawak. And also if I were really go back again, some parts of me and some parts of my cousins and friends in Malaysia can also trace our backs to people in Kalimantan as well. This comes to show that national borders is not what we are, are it does not separate us, but in terms, but we still find our commonality if we look back to our history. So these are one of the interesting things that I find a, a commonality with other, other people in Malaysia and also in Indonesia, Kalimantan as well. We did have a comment from an Indonesian named Dion mm -hmm. who said that uh, your culture is similar to the Dayak culture in Indonesia in Kalimantan and, and you referenced Kalimantan uh, while I was reading that comment. So it's a lot of truth to that. So I wanna broaden the conversation a little bit. We were talking earlier about how uh, community groups, community improvement projects, as they're focused on making a difference, how important it is to have representation from different uh, marginalized communities that aren't always present in those conversations or those efforts. I'd like to hear what you've experienced in terms of uh, broad representation in the groups you've worked with or groups you've observed. So one of the things that I've worked with, I always work with NGOs and a lot of like community work projects. But when I do, when I do uh, be myself in these projects, I realize that much of the people who are in this organization are mostly of the majority of the population of Brunei. So there is, there are always Malay and Muslim. It's not that there's nothing wrong about it, but when we do talk about uh, in terms of issues of addressing such issues to minority uh, minority population, it's quite out of touch or out of reach because such majority population does not understand the experiences of a minority people. So, well, that's one example where if if the minority were asked that they need road infrastructure to access to different parts of the country, but in the end, the majority population gives them food. Thank you, but that's not what we are asking for. We're asking for a better infrastructure of road so we can be connected to other parts of, Bru of Brunei. So as much as there is help, but that's not the actual, actual specific help that some of the minorities wanted for. So there is much more, there's much more of a communication barrier there because of distance and because of different ex life experiences. So one of my, one of my, I believe the solution should be is that the minority people that we should help for, it should be also be included in the discussion of the group to better understanding and have a wholesome uh, target of targeting these such issues. So that's one of the ways where I want to more talk on that is like to be, to include, to include minorities in the conversation as well, because we are more than just the victims, but we can also be agents of change. And just to add to that, uh, a, a US perspective on representation, we in general, we, we, we don't wanna just have quotas. So you don't have your one spot for your woman and one spot for your gay person and one person from each race. That, that is not uh, the goal. The goal really, as you were saying, is to provide an opportunity for people to express another point of view, a life experience. It's not just about clicking off the boxes of diversity. It's having a real diverse range of ideas within the conversation. That is the reason for representation. And I'm sure you would agree with that. So I'm sure you've observed that as, as you illustrated, it's not just having someone represent, it's someone who says, no, these are the needs of our community. We need roads or, or whatever, other use there is. So the indigenous, I wanted to get back to the indigenous communities in Brunei. Are they, do they have full access to the educational system in Brunei? We do, you we are, do. You are clearly well educated. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, 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 access to education, but there are some places where some communities, my, some communities uh, that, that are quite far away, they do not have access to, to a good roads or better access to telecommunications. These are one of the issues that organization can actually help on doing on, which can also be a good, good solutions to the problem. But in terms of education, 
primary and secondary education is quite is quite positive in Brunei side. I do not I can't say much on the Malaysian and Kalimantan side, which they do have an issue of their own or have a different kinds of worms that they that I have no rights to talk on. But in terms of Brunei, we didn't have such a huge issue. But when it comes to further studies and also having scholarships and grants, that's where there is a huge bit of a gap there. As much mm. as the primary is already, it's okay. But when we want to elevate our, ourselves, when we want to improve our community, we aren't able to do so in the sense that there is a system that's not allowing us to improve ourselves for the community, by the community, where the system is very much more of the majority population, but the majority population is not allowing us to have a seat of power for us to change for our community for the better. In the end, that we have to depend on them. But instead, we do wish that we want to be independently sufficient for our own, on our own. It's an excellent point. If you may have the brains to expand your opportunities, but if you don't have the money and there's no scholarships available, then that, that your talents could be wasted. So that's a very important point. So I wanna ask you a, another question unrelated about indigenous communities. Uh, in terms of dating and marriage, if someone wants to date outside of his or her uh, ethnicity, <laughs> is that an option? Uh, this, is, this is an always conversation when it comes to like small minor small community people mm -hmm. it is possible but to be safe you're welcome to go different parts of Borneo to find a partner but sometimes uh, there is a situation not only in my community or in indigenous community but in terms of Brunei as a whole, because Brunei is quite a small country in itself. So what more if it's a minority population in itself? So there's this situation where if you do, if you do go to someone's reception, wedding reception, most probably you might find someone, but in the end, you never know. This could be your direct cousin or your second cousin or your aunt that is far removed, but yet still related quite close. So there is... So before you do want to start to date someone, you do have to ask them, who are you? Who is your parents? Who are you related to? So the same bet is that I'm so blessed and I'm so glad that my indigenous identity is also throughout the whole Borneo. So for those who are single, for those who are watching, if you are finding someone, I do encourage you to find people in Malaysia or Kalimantan if you want of people of the same race. But please be open that as much as we are, as much as we wanted to have in the same identity, but having a mixed marriage is not a problem. You're welcome to do so. Love is be beyond racial identity. <laughs> I, I've heard what you're saying from many, many different communities, especially communities that have a small number of people. It's always this debate. We want to be very open-minded and love to all, but we also want our community to continue. So that, that debate is, is so universal. We do have another question from Indonesia, this time from Sarah. And she's wondering how modernization came to your indigenous community. So many people in indigenous communities don't always live in the main cities. So how do, they, how do they deal with change? How do they modernize? How do they get access to the latest technology? How does that dynamic play out in, in Brunei? So modernization in Brunei came about in during our independence or say that it began during World War II, that it, be, it boomed up during our independence uh, 37 years ago. So after when we were in the, uh, after we were gaining our independence from the, from, from England, then that's, that's where we started to form our own, Brunei started to form its own identity. That is with the seven indigenous official groups. But when it comes to Omorinais in our identity, uh, in my communities that we have to go to the cities or to much more reachable and accessible, uh, accessible area. But at the same time, once we're there, we have to go back home. Uh, that is back to where we're originally from. But that's where it started to have that, hey, there needs to be a better infrastructure, infrastructure of roads. But there's as much that can continue on as the cities get much more modernized. 
there are parts of the uh, some parts in uh, Brunei is not much as developed. So there's such a pull and push factor where a lot of people want to go to the city to find job opportunities and whatnot. But when it comes to being modernized and globalized, in terms of cultural roots are the are the are the reasons that we are going to forget because we're much more disconnected from our homeland or much more disconnected to our cultural identity. But there is time where we're in 21st century, we're in 2021, where we are internet and connectivity are much more accessible. That's why that that's how we're able to be modernized, but at the same time, it's not as modernized as the ones in the city. But that's why, as, as I mentioned, is that uh, connecting, uh, physically connected and to be present is one of the factors that is important uh, in Brunei because that's because that's how we're able to connect to other people. And yet again, Brunei is quite small. We're quite like almost the size of Singapore. It's really quite small, but at the same time, we're not as much as developed. So it comes to show that we should be developed in all parts of Brunei. We have no reason to say that we can't be connected. We can't be connected. We can't be developed. Well, one of the big focuses of development is education. We talked a little bit about access to education. And I know you've had a very special educational opportunity because you have been part of the, your Wysili Academic Fellow, yeah. uh, 2020 Academic Fellow. So I'd love for you to tell us audi our audience a little bit about that program. So I'm actually one of the Wysili Fellow for the year 2020 for spring. But of course, when we, we were supposed to go to the States in the month of March, but as we all know, the pandemic starts and hits in the month of March globally. So sadly, all the fellows of YCD Spring is unable to go to the state. So we had to postpone it or we just had to put it to a pause. We're so, then we're supposed to wait it for fall. But when fall comes, that's when a lot of the spikes in the whole of the world has, is getting higher and higher. So we have to push it back to next year. So technically, I've, I've I am a fellow, Wysili fellow for 2020, but I have not went to the States yet. So the program started, the program cannot be on its original form because of this pandemic. As all things changes and evolve with, with this such of this change of the pandemic, same goes to our program as well. So at the moment, we have a hybrid program where it's like, at the moment, we're having uh, two, two Zoom sessions per week for the course of five weeks and then when we do finish this program then when it come when traveling is safe then we're able to go to the states but even before this hybrid program that i'm having at the moment we do have our zoom meet meet up once a week a few months ago just to have a catch-up just to talk about who we are what we do and what are the hopes and hopes we're doing and how are we keeping up with this uh, covid situation so so far for the past one year of being this YC Lee fellow, it's quite an interesting roller coaster because literally it's a different and new experiences because we're having this experience in times of the pandemic where previous fellow have never had such experiences before. So everything we do is quite a, literally a new experiences in terms of Zoom, the challenges of connecting, con uh, the challenges of having to speak over one another when it comes to Zoom, but yet here we are understanding Zoom etiquette and whatnot. It's, a, it's an adventure. It's quite an interesting adventure, good or bad, but it is an adventure on itself. So that's one of my experiences with this YC Lee uh, 2020 with these COVID times. We are all on a roller coaster the last year. <laughs> very challenging. And of course, we're doing it to save lives. So we're all willing to do it and figure it out. So it's, it's worthwhile, but it is very challenging. What kind of, I, I, this program is very focused on developing leadership. What kind, of, uh, what, what kind of sessions have you had that you found particularly interesting? Do you have one or two tips you wanna share with our audience that you found particularly meaningful? So one of the things that YCD taught us about is that how do we create an idea and how this idea could make a huge change in the community and society as a whole. Those are the normal, usual things that uh, y us YCD and previous YCD has learned about. But because of this pandemic, there is this new topic or syllabus that we are have we have to address on that is 
to be resilient even during pandemic times? How are we creating ideas and exercise, exercising and secreting these ideas in terms of social distancing or executing it in terms of this pandemic where we have to do, we wanted to do good things, but at the same time, we cannot meet physically because that's not safe. So how safe or how resilient can our ideas be in this, in this pandemic or how effective can it be? So this was quite an interesting conversation where we have never, this, we have never experienced such a hard hit pandemic in the past few years because this is quite new to us. So how can we experience this? And what is our experience when, when the normal current projects that we're having, how, what were the challenges? How are we changing? What are we learning from this? So this is the interesting lessons that we, YCD 2020, are learning in the moment, which is quite a good and interesting topic that everyone should be talking about. How resilient are we able to integrate into this new era of post or during post pandemic? When you're passionate about something, nothing should stop you. Maybe you have to tweak those goals a little bit, but if you have a cause, no matter what disturbances come along the way or changes come along the way, exactly, develop resiliency and go for it. You have to be adaptable, but keep, hold on to that passion, hold on to that big idea and keep going for it. That is excellent advice. We do get another question from our audience. And this question is that there are a lot of mystical beliefs in the Dayak tribe. And in our modern world, there's this conflict between sort of certain ancient rituals, ancient beliefs, and how do we balance the two? So I'm wondering, do you, uh, how have you balanced some of the uh, ancient beliefs or long-term beliefs of your community and the, the modern world? I think the one way of how I balance such, such identity that it's known to be in the past and how I brought it up is that there's this one saying by one, this one local designer in Malaysia. He said that, do not go back to tradition, but go forward with it. So we took, so we learn and understanding our history, our culture, and what we wear. We know that we know we should learn and understand it. And how can we translate this to the modern times? Where in the past, where we always wear, where one, one example is that the patterns that I have that I wore, it could have in the past it was hand handmade where it's it is it is hand drawn and handmade 100 percent but to put it forward it's able to meet into this garment is able to meet using machine wires but yet the patterns are what is quite familiar from the past and still be present in today's in today and also the future so we should not forget and disregard our identity 100 percent but we do have to learn and exercise how can we translate the past and the tradition into forward one of the ways that I do is that, of course, that I wear my traditional garments or at times that if I want to learn on how the process was made in the past, how can I improve to make it much more modernized in the future? Or the language that I speak, it could be, it, some of the words could be forgotten because sometimes different languages adopted different languages as well. Sometimes there are some people who use English words to replace original words that is of the mother tongue. But we have to remember what was, this, what were the words before in, in the introduction to English? So my take is that always remember and always do your research on your culture and on your identity and how can you still con uh, preserve it for the future? So that's my take on that. That was really beautiful, Roy. I have to say, that was really beautiful. I was really moved by that. And I love that line. Don't look back, move forward with. That it captures a lot. So I do hope you get to go to the United States. You didn't get to have your trip. If you visit the United States, uh, what, what is one city on your list? Where would you like to visit? Uh, I would like to visit Washington. And mm -hmm. I would also like to visit well, I was supposed to vis visit Nebraska because that's where I'm supposed to be, University of Nebraska, Omaha. So uh -huh. I'm looking forward to have like an American experience or the American dream, you know? Like when I was younger, I would see 
TV shows where they they hop onto a yellow school bus. In Asia, we don't have a yellow school bus, so mm-hmm. I'm quite excited to be in a yellow school bus. Like, oh my god, living the dream! <laughs> All right, we're gonna make sure you get to see some yellow school buses, <laughs> and, and I really want to get to see Brunei. So, besides teaching me a dance, uh, what if I visited you in Brunei? What's something special or culturally uh, that? to which you would want to introduce me in Brunei? The food, that's first, Uh because food always connects people regardless of if you have a language beer and whatnot. Food, because everyone has a stomach, everyone has a mouth to eat. Second would be the, second would be the rainforest. Out of the odd different countries in Borneo, Brunei is one of those 80% of it is covered by rain, uh, by the rainforest where where it is still quite intact and untouched. So this is one of the things that I'm quite proud of Brunei where we are we still still keep and protect our rainforest where it's where other countries they are quite develop, developing and also doing plantations but it's un, it's environmental unsustainable. So if I, you do come to Brunei Food and the rainforest. That's what I would bring you to. Can tourists visit the rainforest? Yes, yes. There are some areas where it's reserved, where you're not allowed to visit, but there's some area where you're welcome to explore and visit as well. Oh, fantastic. That's great. All right. Another couple of questions about America, and then we're going to have to wrap up. But uh, <laughs> Uh, could you share one of your favorite U.S. movies? One of your favorite American movies? What of my favorite American movie? I think one of my favorite American movies would be. Ha! Huh, I have not watched American movies for a while because I'm much more of like an Asian or C- movie sincere type of person. But I think I could tell you what. What was the last American movie that I saw was? Uh, Marvel. Marvel. Oh, Marvel movies. When yeah. Mar- yeah, yeah. I believe the recent one is WandaVision. I think a lot yeah. of people are watching that at the moment. It's quite interesting in Netflix. What, what is one of your favorite superheroes? One of my superheroes? Super- I do not have a favorite, but I do like The Little Man. What's this? I like Ant-Man. Oh, Ant-Man. <laughs> yeah. Because you're a leader. You're a form of a superhero. You're trying to do what you can to make a difference in your community, to uh, raise the awareness, uh, develop the conversation about indigenous communities, marginalized communities, making sure that everyone has a voice, everyone has an opportunity to contribute. That is a very important US value. Apparently it's a Bernayan value, it's your value. So let's keep working towards that dream together. We're happy to support you and we wanna continue doing so. So thank, thank you, you for all your hard work. So we, we once again went over 30 minutes, we always do because these conversations are so interesting and I love meeting my guests and talking to my guests. And I hope that Elroy, I really hope that we get to meet in person. I hope that day comes soon. We'll see what happens with the pandemic, but we'll we'll make it happen somehow. So I want to thank our audience for joining us for another amazing show. Uh, Thanks for all the active questions from our audience. It really was delightful, and we look forward to the next show. Elroy, do you want to say parting words? Either how about in your in your indigenous language? Uh, One of the famous phrases in Iban that always been known for is called Aging Hidup, Aging Laban. It's a word saying, if you're still alive, you can still fight. So no matter what projects or passion that you have, if you're still alive, if your heart is still beating, you have more reasons to fight for what you believe for. So yeah, that's my parting words for you guys and everyone who's watching. That is a fantastic message to end the show. Thank you so much, Elroy, and thanks to our audience. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.